Amen. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. It's good to be here tonight. Amen. I hope you've had a good week. If not, I hope you had a bad week and are glad to be in God's house. Amen. Uh, Noel Marino asked us, uh, he sent me a message, asked us to pray for him tonight. His, um, he'd been dealing with prostate cancer. And uh, he, he went to the doctor the other day and they did some, they did some kind of blood test. And they said his counts are high, which means the cancer is still there. So he wants us to pray for him. Uh, pray for Sister Ariel down in uh, Arizona. Uh, she got sick and uh, had to have an ambulance come get her. Her heart, she was having, uh, what did I say it was? Where's Alicia? I said something. Anyway, something, something with her heart, not right. So they kept her overnight, monitored her, so pray for her. Uh, then Sister Jeannie back here, usually comes, sits right there where Brian sits. She fell and broke her hip. They did surgery on her. Now she's in rehab at Crystal Oaks, going to be there for about six weeks. So we're going to pray for her, pray for Sister Bernice. She's at Crystal Oaks. Uh, she had hip surgery. She fell and broke hers. So pray for her. A lot of things to pray about tonight. Sister Linda Toomey, keep her in your prayers. And um, we'll look at our list here in a little bit. Ephesians chapter 2, we are looking at the method, how God saves people. How God takes a sinner, converts them into a saint. If you think about it, the God that created everything out of nothing, what did he use to recreate you? You were nothing. And yet God makes a saint out of people who were used to be sinners. God makes saints out of them. People that used to love sin don't love sin no more. They hate it. Amen. That's how, that's one of the, what's one of the how you knows. How do I know I'm saved? How bad do you hate sin? How bad do you hate what sin has done in your life? The cost, what, what it's done to you, what it's done to your relationships, what it's done to your health, your wealth. I mean, the devil, sin costs. That was the idea behind, if you look at the book of Leviticus, the idea behind every, every family of Israel having to bring, whether they were poor or wealthy, having to bring something of theirs and offer it to God. And they were supposed to teach their children, why are we taking this to the Levite priest, Daddy? Daddy, why are we taking this lamb? This is our best lamb. This is our best goat. Why are we taking this to the priest? And the daddy was supposed to teach their children, son, it's because of our sin. Our sin costs us. There's always a price to pay. And the idea behind a lamb or a ram or a goat or a bullock, it's the idea of substitution. Something that did no sin had to pay the price for the ones who did the sin. That's the idea behind the Old Testament sacrifices was... It was a substitutionary atonement. Rather than you laying yourself down on the altar and having yourself killed, rather than you paying the price of death, something else that did no sin has to pay the penalty. And of course, that was looking forward to Christ. So Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5. We'll read this and we'll move through this. It is by grace and the atonement of the cross... Ephesians 2 verse 5, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened, uh, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. That's not the first time he says that. And he says, and hath raised us up together, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. One of these days, all of God's saints, he's going to make us sit together. Amen. Whether you like to sit by him now or not, God's going to make you sit by him in heaven. 
set together in heavenly places, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Turn to John 3.16. You probably don't even have to turn there. You know what it says. But since he mentioned the gift of God, John 3.16 tells us then what that gift is. For God so loved the world that he gave. If you want to know the definition of love, true love is giving. And giving in an unconditional manner. If you give to somebody, but you expect something back, that's not real love. Because you are expecting to get something back. It's a payment. But if you give to somebody without any expectation, if you say to your spouse, honey, I love you. And you don't have to have a response back. That's love. So I can tell my wife, honey, I love you. She doesn't always have to say it back. That's not why I said it. I said it because I want her to know and I want her to know every day that I still love her. If she responds back, that's great. I feel good. But if, even if she doesn't respond back right away or she doesn't respond back at all, doesn't matter. I still love her. And I'm not going to stop loving her. That's unconditional love. So that's what God did. God so loved the world and he did it unconditionally that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do we believe what John Calvin said? John Calvin said... That God's offering of Christ was only to those whom he would save. Do we believe that? That's not what it says here, is it? I think Calvin was wrong. I don't know what all else he said, but I know if he said that, he was wrong. God did not offer his son just to the elect. The Bible says plainly here that he gave it to who? The whole world. Even to the people who he knew would not accept Jesus as that Savior, as that atonement, God still offered Christ to the whole world. Why? Because He loved the whole world. He loves His creation. So, for by grace... I, I didn't finish reading John 3, 16. That He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life for God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world. He says to the world. Didn't say to the elect. Said to the world. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Even though God already has a list of everybody that He knows is going to be saved, He still offers His Son available to the entire world. Red and yellow, black and white, their oppression is in his sight. Every nation, every color, every kindred, every tribe, from every place, at every time in the earth, Christ was, is, and will be the gift that God gives to all mankind, whether they accept it or not. But God offers it to everybody. For God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So if John Calvin said... That that salvation is only for the elect, those predetermined upon whom God selected. If John Calvin said that, I would say the scripture would disagree with John Calvin. By the way, let me just tell you something. There's not a book in your Bible written by John Calvin. He was not an apostle. He was not a prophet. So why believe in him? There are churches that are named John Calvin such and such church. John Calvin, there's a John Calvin Presbyterian church up Highway 270 on your way to the airport. John Calvin, Presbyterian Church. I wonder what they believe, Brother George. Sounds to me like they believe what John Calvin said. And I say to you, you don't have to. But you should believe what God said. Amen. Amen. Father in heaven, bless your word tonight. Open it up to our eyes, our ears, our hearts, our understanding. Give us knowledge. Give us depth of knowledge, Father. Not too many churches, not too many people who say they believe in Jesus, 
Do they want the depth of knowledge? Do they want to know what the Bible says? So, Father, you've just put it in our hearts. We want to know. So I pray, God, that you would teach us tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Titus chapter 3. I'll give you about five seconds each to turn to these places so I can kind of move on. Titus chapter 3. This is under the theme of it is a grace. It is by grace. God's grace. God's unmerited favor to the entire world. The atonement of the cross. That's the means by which we can be saved. In other words... God had a law and that law must, the needs of the law must be fulfilled or why would God have the law to begin with? I mean, could not God just say, I know everybody's a sinner. Hmm. Why don't I just save everybody? Why don't I just wipe away everybody's sins? Well, let me ask you a question. Courtney. Are you sure that it was your decision to marry Todd? Or did he make you do it against your will? Okay. That's my point. Believe it or not, there's a lot of people out in the world who want absolutely nothing to do with God and His Son, Jesus Christ. So why should God make them, against their will, be married to Jesus Christ, be the bride of Christ? Why should God force them, against their will, to be an unwilling bride? God gave us a choice. So Titus chapter 3, verse 5, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. So you can underline the part, not by works of righteousness, because it's not our righteousness. And he said, so in, in this verse, he's included here. Let me try to dig my pen out here. In this verse, he's eliminated the works of righteousness. He's saying that it's by his mercy, but it is by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. And my good friend, Brother Reg Kelly, made a good point in a message he preached here a while back about the necessity of being washed. Every time in the Old Testament, if somebody, for whatever reason, was unclean, let's say a woman going through her time became unclean, or let's say that after she had a child, there was a period by which she was unclean, or in case somebody had leprosy, or somebody touched somebody that had leprosy, or somebody that had something to do, they touched a dead body. The law then, because God knew about germs before man knew about germs, God said that they're unclean. And if you touch them, you're unclean. And you're, un and you're unclean for a time. It's like God, was, God knew about the incubation period of germs. So he said there's a period of time by which if you touch a dead body, you're unclean. So there was two things that had to happen. Number one, you had to fulfill the time of your uncleanness and your separation. But the second thing you did was you had to wash. That uncleanness had to be washed away from you. And the necessity of washing. I'm glad that there's a law now that says in every restaurant there must be a sign in every bathroom that employees go in... Wash your hands. I think people who work in the food industry ought to mandatorily have to wash their nasty, dirty, filthy hands. Amen? Listen, I've been in third world countries where they don't have such laws. Trust me, it's better if you wash your hands or they wash their hands. So, your sins, even though you, you, you say, well, I sinned, but that was a year ago. Doesn't matter. You might have fulfilled a time where you think God should be over it. But if you're not washed, you're not clean. Just because what you did was 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago, and you think surely God has gotten over it by now, that's not the case. You must still be washed. And that's what that's for. By the washing 
of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Do you not feel better, John, after you've worked all day to come in and take a shower? How do you feel when you take that shower? You feel brand new. I'm clean once again. And that's the purpose of that. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 9. The Bible says, Who has saved us and called us with an holy calling. Not Here again, not according to our works. Not according to our works. But according to His own purpose and grace. Think about it for a minute. Does it not make you feel special? When you think about all the people in this world, Cubby, who have heard the gospel and rejected it, or all the people in this world who have never heard the gospel, why did God pick you? Why did God pick you? I don't know the answer to that. What I know is God picked you it says, His own purpose and grace. So if God selected you, number one, don't chunk up with pride over that. Get out on your face and bawl a little bit and cry and say, God, I don't know why you picked me, but I'm very glad you did. God's own purpose and God's grace, which was, hear that word given, which was given us in Christ Jesus, when? Before the world began. So think about this. You're saved. God wrote your name. Here, I'm going to write it up here. Trish. That's your name. See it up there? Aren't you special? So God wrote your name in a book of life. But when did He do it? Did He do it the day you got saved? No, according to the Scripture, He had it written down before the world began. Now, how can God do that? Because God is able, because He's the Most High, God is able to see every event in this universe's history in every time and in every age. God is able to see everything. And before He even created the world, God knew that you were going to be saved. I mean, who in here, who in here, be honest, has ever wished that you had a time machine that you could wait until the lottery numbers were picked, go back in time, buy that ticket? Would you not do that? I mean, if you saw the winning ticket numbers, would you go back in time and buy the wrong ticket? That'd be waste, that'd be, why would you do that, right? Brian, you would buy that winning ticket, right? It's because you had foreknowledge of what that event was. And that's what Peter said. He said, we are elect according to the foreknowledge of God. So it's God's purpose that he chose you. God's foreknowledge of, you, of knowing you, knowing that you would make the decisions you would make. Brian, God knew how your life would turn out to bring you to the point of salvation. Was it not, I'm not just picking on Brian, but was it not your sin that brought you to the cross? He got tired of it. He said, I can't live this way anymore. And he just, he was drawn to the cross and God, God met him there because God was waiting there because God knew he would show up there. Boy, that's good. That's God. Amen. He's smart. All right, come on. Why won't you turn on me? There we go. First Timothy chapter 1. Oh, look at this. Verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. That means it's worthy for us to accept it. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Christ died. He died for all sinners. But the fact that God knows who was going to be at the cross and who isn't doesn't prohibit nor does it make it mandatory that we show up. We still have free will. Romans chapter 4 verse 1. Turn there. What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? Now remember, 
Abraham, if you, if you think then that keeping the law or keeping part of the law gives you merits with God, what about Abraham? Because Abraham was righteous and God gave him righteousness before there ever was the law of Moses. In fact, Abraham, when he met Melchizedek, what did Abraham do to Melchizedek? What did he do? Concerning Melchizedek, when he met him, the king of Salem, king of peace, what did he give to him? T tithes. Now, how did Abraham know to give Melchizedek 10% of all that he had? How did he know that? It was before the law ever was. The law of tithing. You find that in the, in the priesthood law in the book of Leviticus and other places. You'll find it there. But Abraham just gave 10% of everything that he had to Melchizedek, the king of Salem. He did that in faith before there ever was a law saying that he had to do it. One of my points in this is that when you're right with God, you do things not because the law says you have to do it. You do it because you want to do it. What shall we say then that Abraham our father is pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that, now listen to this now. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So, you're one of these groups now, or you're, you're, you're kind of leaning, and I know that, I'll just say it like this. I know someone who, after having been taught the doctrines of salvation by grace, has then, because of the influence of the internet, been following after some of these Sabbath keepers and some of these Hebrew roots law keepers, and now they have dropped this idea that you're saved by grace and they have leaned over and accepted this idea that you're saved by partial law keeping. I know people that have done that. I don't understand that. I mean, it's, it's, I guess they've convinced them that they're saved partially by grace. But God wants us to keep as much of the law as we possibly can. You know what that sounds like to me? It sounds like Mormon doctrine. The church, the Mormon church tells everybody that God's grace is applied to you only after you have done all you can do. In other words, works first. Then when you can't go no more, God will apply grace to the rest of it. Is that how God saves? Look at that verse again, verse 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. In other words, you cannot choose half grace, half works. If you choose works, then you choose all of the law. Because James said, if a man offend the law in one point, he is guilty of all. So... You say that, oh, I'm going to try to keep as much of the law as I can because that's what pleases God. That's not what pleases God, but that's what you say you're going to try. Well, if you try it then, then you are obligated to perform all of the law. And if you don't, then you owe God a debt that you cannot pay. You cannot pay it. That was the purpose of the cross to begin with. To, and that was the purpose of the law to, to make sin big and make it sure that everybody realizes that they're sinners and they can't pay their own debt. So that's why they would come to the cross to begin with. That's why I came. So verse five, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Do you see that phrase justifieth the ungodly? Who does that mean, George? Wicked, hell deserving, low down sinners. You know who Brother George said? He said it means me. He's got it right in his head. He's got, it's because he's got it right in his heart. You realize after a time that all the goodness that you try to do, you still are going to fail God. 
So what are you going to do about that? Does that mean you can't be saved? Does that mean you're not ever going to be saved? Because, well, you sinned after you got saved. So you, obviously you're not saved anymore. That's not how God sees it. God didn't justify you on the basis of your works to begin with. So why would God continue to justify you if you tried works after you're saved? You weren't saved by works before you got saved and you don't stay saved by works after you're saved. You are saved the way Abraham was saved. You're saved because you believed what God said and God justifies you just like he did Abraham. Amen. Romans chapter 4. Look down at verse 14. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. Because the law worketh wrath. Where, for where no law is, there is no transgression. So before God told Adam about that tree, there was no transgression because there was no law. Once God said, you should not eat of it, then, now there's a possibility of sin because now there's a law and where there's a law, there's going to be a sin. But if there's no law, there's no sin. And that's what he's saying here. So verse 16, therefore, it is a faith that it might be by grace to the end. The promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So, and here's what that means. God made a promise to Abraham and that promise extended to Abraham's seed, his offspring. So what the Bible's saying here is what God promised to Abraham, we then, John, can qualify to be the recipients of that because now Abraham is our father. We sing that song, Father Abraham, many sons, many sons have father. We need to do that Sunday. Okay. I am one of them and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. So he's the father of us all. That's how we are accounted as the people of Israel because we've done it by faith. Verse 17, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead and called those things which be not as though they were. Listen, look at verse 18, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations. Now think about what God did here when he said against hope. How old was Abraham when Isaac was conceived? How old? Do you mind know? He was 100 years old. How old was Sarah when she conceived? 90. 90 years old. 90-year-old women don't conceive children. 100-year-old men don't father children. Right? So here's Abraham and, and Sarah... They're not just old, they're real old. Within years of dying, Sarah died 120, 121, 123 years old, something like that. But anyway, so here she is within years of dying. She's even decided that she's too old to have a baby. So that's why she brought Hagar into this thing. And so she thinks there is no hope for me to have a baby. That's why she laughed when the Lord said it. And then she lied about laughing. And yet, what did God do? Make, he fulfilled his promise anyway. So against hope means you've gotten to a place where you don't think there's any possibility. Listen to me. You've gotten to a place where you don't think there is any possibility that this can work out in your favor. And when you get to that place, that's where God wanted you. So against hope, he believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Verse 19, and being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about an hundred years old. See, there was right there. Neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. You know what that means? He means it wasn't, he wasn't drunk. He had a spirit, the spirit of belief, the spirit of faith in him. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform. 
Therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now, think about it. You came to a point in your life where you said, I can't sin like this. I can't do it anymore. And you think there's no hope for somebody like me until you hear about Jesus. And then all of a sudden now you start thinking, is it possible that even as wicked as I have been, God can still save me? That's when you, against hope, believe in hope, stagger not at the promise of God, considering not that it's over and done with and there is no hope for you, you realize that, yes, there is hope. There's always hope when you bring God in on it. Let me, let me address this for a minute, and I'm not trying to be mean. Most people who commit suicide have lost all hope. They have gotten to a place where they have said, there is no hope for me. I'll give you an example. A lady called me a couple years ago, the church that she used to go to. The pastor, everybody loved him. They thought he was a great guy. All of a sudden, investigation started. They started investigating him. Because boys were coming and saying, this man did things to me, this pastor. When the investigation started, he went out alone into a field, shot himself. Because in his mind, he had no hope. This was a pastor. A pastor who's supposed to tell everybody... There's always hope in God. Yet, couldn't believe it for himself. And killed himself because he knew he was in trouble. And I've heard of pastors. King James pastors. Who killed themselves. Because they were caught up in sin did not want to face the shame of what they were doing and took their life. I believe, it's, I'm, it's not my place to judge, I understand that, but I believe with most cases, it is a failure to recognize that God can do what we think cannot be done. And it doesn't make sense to me you realize you've been caught up in sin. And you would rather face hell fire than temporary shame. I don't get that. You're looking at a guy that is scared to death of going to hell. And to me, there is nothing, nothing worth going to hell over. Nothing. Nothing. Therefore, it is imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed unto him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Do you believe? Do you believe? Romans 11, verse 5. Even so then, at this present time, also, at this present time, also, meaning... That it was at that present time back then and it is at this present time also. There is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. And I'm just keep reiterating the same thing. The internet is full of wolves who are wearing sheep's clothing who will try to convince you people because it's happened in this church. 
the internet got a hold of people and convinced them that they had to keep parts of the law in order to make God happy. And it makes me angry. I'm sick of it. And I'm not going to be nice about it because you are messing with grace. You want to try to keep the law? Then go ahead and you keep the law. But then it's no more of grace. Even if you think, well, I th still think we have to keep Sabbath. If it's of works, it cannot be of grace. Otherwise, it's not of grace. Then it's going to be of works. But you, ca you cannot have both. Pick one. I've realized I cannot do it by works. And if by grace it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works and it is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. Try putting that on a bumper sticker. Hey, man, if you're going to make a Christian bumper sticker, put this scripture on there. If it's by grace and it's of grace, but if it's of works and it's of works. And if it's of works, it's not by grace. Why don't people get that in their head? I don't know. And I'll say this. How do you recognize the real gospel from the fake gospel or another gospel like what Paul was saying about? To the degree that it adds a performance on your part necessary for salvation, then that's another gospel. I don't care if it adds one thing. If it adds one thing to grace, it is no longer of grace than it is of works. You're hoping... You're hoping then that you will continue to keep the Sabbath and not violate Sabbath laws. Else, if you violate Sabbath laws, what does that do to your salvation? It's gone. According, according to people like Finnis Dake, you sin one time, you've lost your salvation. One sin, lose your salvation. One sin. And Dake said you had to repent and get the salvation back. Because if you died in that unrepentant state, you're going to go to hell. Because you sinned one time. That's not, that's not, that is not the hope and the grace that I'm hanging on to. That's, that's, that's worse than a sinner. Even a sinner is saying, if I do enough good deeds, maybe, maybe I can please God with my good deeds. This guy says, you sin one time, you're out. It's like God is up there waiting for you to make a mistake. Gotcha! I'm going to send you to hell right now. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. Lest I should be exalted above measure for this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Now, I'm going to start on this. And we're going to look at this in depth next week. It is, salvation is continuing in the covenant of faith. Not a continuance in being good after you got saved. Now, if you're good enough, you'll stay safe. That's not it. God saves the faithful. Those who trust. That's who God saves. Psalm 78. Verse 9. The children of Ephraim being armed and carrying bows. Turned back in the day of battle. What direction did they go? Back. They went back. They got out. There in the wilderness, they sent 12 spies in. 12 spies come back. 10 of them said, we did pull the giants, walls, place is crazy. We'll never make it. At that point, where did the people of Israel want to go? Back. Back. Did they ever make it to the promised land? Carcass rotted. You're right, George. How many? Two. Out of 
some 600,000 that left Egypt, two of them made it. Look around you. These pews. How many people start and never finish? You never finish. This neighborhood, this town, this county is full of people who used to go to church. And they quit. Quit going. Well, we went to church when we was kids, but we don't go no more. Why? I can just be just as good a Christian at home as I can in any church. That's a lot of what you'll hear. They turned back in the day of battle. They kept not. Look at verse 10. They kept not the covenant of God. Who broke the covenant? Did God do it? No, they did. And refused to walk in His law. And forgot His works and His wonders that He had showed them. My goodness, they saw manna fall from heaven. My goodness, they saw the Red Sea open up. They saw water coming out of a dry rock. They saw God up on Mount Sinai. They heard the thunder. They heard God's voice. They heard God's voice with their ears. Scared them to death. They saw the Ten Commandments written with the finger of God. They saw the pillar of cloud there every day. Pillar of fire every single night. They saw that. They still turned back. You have seen none of that. And yet you haven't turned back. What does that tell you? It's not by sight. It's by faith. Psalm 85. Surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him. That glory may dwell in our land. Whose salvation go to? Those that fear him. Second Chronicles 34. Go inquire the Lord for me and for them that are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book that is found. For great is that this about Josiah, is it not? For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out upon us because our fathers have kept not the word of the Lord to do after all that is written in this book. What did they not keep? Works? Kept not faith. They kept not the word of the Lord. Why did God reject Saul? Same reason. Why would God reject anybody? They kept not the word of the Lord. I haven't, I've been, man, I have been very, very busy. And I have been keeping up with a lot of news. Did they, did the Methodist church decide on what to do with the LGBTQ crowd? They decided not go with it? Well, that's shocking. Huh? Split decision, huh? So what you got is half of them said, yeah, let's do it. Huh? Yeah, give, give it another 10 years. Let's, let's, when we load in more sodomites into these churches, they'll overturn that. Huh? Didn't build a wall. Yeah. So what does that tell you? Did they keep the word of the Lord? John Wesley would roll over in his grave if he saw the denomination that was formed after his teachings. John Wesley and his, who was, it, who was his brother? Charles Wesley? They used to go everywhere, sing and preach the gospel. Talk about the love of God. People be saved. They used to hear Methodist revivals. And now they're deciding on whether or not to accept sodomy that's rejecting the word of the Lord. You reject the word of the Lord, you hang it up. Amen? So what, what, you know what I'm going to tell you? Hang on to your Bible. Die for it. Die for it. Because it's all you have. 